Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Firefighters were called to a scene near Lake Springfield in central Illinois one early Sunday morning in August 1992. When they arrived, they found a dilapidated old building that had been closed for years, completely engulfed in flames. The fire, which later turned out to have been deliberately set, destroyed a place called the Lake Club, a once grand restaurant and nightclub that had been out of business since the 1960s. Other businesses had come and gone in the building since the demise of the club, but most people recalled the 1940s and 1950s as the golden age of the Lake Club. It was from this time period that stories of big bands, live radio shows, and illegal gambling emerged as fond remembrances of yesterday. But it was also during this time that the stories of the club's resident ghost emerged, a tragic nightclub employee who simply refused to leave. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The Lake Club opened as a nightclub in 1940, but the building on Fox Bridge Road had seen many incarnations in the years prior to that, including as several restaurants and even a skating rink called the Joy Inn. In 1940, two dance promoters named Harold Henderson and Hugo Giovignoli renovated the place and opened it for business as the Lake Club. The club soon became one of the hottest night spots in Illinois drawing customers from all over the state. It boasted a raised dance floor surrounded by a railing, with curved walls and a swanky atmosphere that made patrons feel as though a New York club had been transported to the shores of Lake Springfield. The owners concentrated on bringing big-name entertainment to the club and succeeded. Among the many top performers were Bob Hope, Ella Fitzgerald, Guy Lombardo, Pearl Bailey, Spike Jones, Nelson Eddy, Woody Herman, Mickey Rooney, and many others. The constant stream of entertainers and big bands brought capacity crowds to the club every night. During the height of its popularity, the club even hosted a radio call-in show that broadcast music and entertainment all over the area live. The Lake Club thrived for nearly two decades becoming known not only for its swinging entertainment, but for its first-rate gambling as well. Wealthy customers and the society elite of Springfield and Decatur frequented the club for the musical guests and also for the billiard tables, craps and gaming tables, slot machines and card games. This part of the club operated in secret in a back part of the building, known only to high rollers and special customers. However, in December 1958, 
the golden days of the Lake Club came to an end. The partners had survived many setbacks over the years, from lawsuits to foreclosures, but the club would not survive the two undercover detectives who gained access to the gambling rooms that Christmas season. The club was immediately shut down, although patrons continued dining and dancing while the actual raid was going on. The two state troopers who entered the gambling rooms were the first police officers to arrive, but many more followed. Newspaper accounts reported the police confiscated all sorts of gambling equipment, including tables, dice, slot machines, and large quantities of cash. The billiard tables were so large they had to be dismantled to get them out of the room. Business began to falter in the wake of the raid, and the place finally closed down in the 1960s. Gio Vignoli blamed the failure of the club on the gambling crackdown, always maintaining that the entertainment had been just part of the club's appeal. However, he refused to give up. Despite his partner Harold Henderson's death in 1977, Gio Vignoli managed to open the club again, with other parties managing different projects in the building. During this next popular time in the club's history, it was managed by Bill Carmian and Tom Blasco as a rock club. In 1980, it was leased by Pat Tavine, who also operated it as a rock club until 1988, when it closed down for good. The Lake Club was destroyed in the fire just a few years later. It was in August 1979 that the Lake Club, known in 1980 when the story came out as the Sober Duck Rock and Disco Club, gained national notoriety. It was at this time when the ghost of Albert Rudy Craner was finally put to rest. According to the many patrons and staff members who had experiences there, the haunting of the Lake Club first began in 1974. At the time, the club was in the midst of a revival in interest, and the business was under the ownership of Tom Blasco and Bill Carmian, two Springfield men who were booking rock acts into the club. The building itself was still owned by Hugo Giovignoli and Harold Henderson. Bill Carmian was the first to notice that something strange was going on at the club. Both he and Tom Blasco had experienced cold chills in the building, along with hearing odd sounds and getting feelings of being watched in certain rooms. One afternoon, he came into the club and sat down at the bar with the lights off. Suddenly, he heard the sound of a piano being played in another room. He got up to see who else was in the building with him, and as he stepped into the room, the music stopped. The room was completely empty. Weird things continued to happen. Often on Monday nights while Carmian would be in the building going over the weekend receipts, he would hear a door near the office open and footsteps crossing the floor. He would jump from his seat to see who was there, but the hallway was always empty. Carmian also remembered a salesman visiting his office one evening when a glass flew off a table and hit the wall on the opposite side of the room. The salesman left in a hurry. By 1976, the haunting had intensified and things began happening more often and in front of more witnesses. A club bartender was pouring a drink one night when the glass in front of him suddenly shot up into the air and landed over his shoulder. A waitress also experienced the antics of the ghost one night when she went to serve a drink to a customer, only to find the glass inexplicably filled with chocolate. She would later insist the glass had been absolutely clean when she handed it to the bartender. Carmian was the first of the club's staff to guess the identity of the ghost who was plaguing the club. He recalled that a former employee had committed suicide in the building several years before. On a lark, he started calling the ghost by this man's name, which was Rudy. Albert Rudy Cranor had worked at the Lake Club during its heyday of the 1940s and 50s. He was described as being well-liked and popular with the entertainers and the customers. He was a very large man, well over 250 pounds, and he had snow-white hair. He was remembered as one of the club's most memorable characters, and even 50 years later, people still remember him. 
They speak fondly of him and recall him as a nice man and their favorite bartender. After the club fell on hard times following the gambling raid, Rudy also began experiencing some personal difficulties. He was a very private person, so no one really knew what was going on. But they did notice that he began to drink heavily while on the job. They also began to notice some changes in his personality and appearance. He seemed to be more tired than usual, and dark circles had begun to appear under his eyes. Then, one night, he became sick and had to be rushed to the hospital. It took several men to carry him downstairs to the ambulance. He returned to the club after a two-week stay in the hospital, but he was never the same again. On June 27, 1968, Rudy shot himself with a high-powered rifle in one of the back rooms at the club. He died in the hospital the next morning, never regaining consciousness. No one was ever sure why Rudy had killed himself, but regardless, he wouldn't stay gone for long. In a few short years, he would return to haunt his beloved club. The strange events at the club continued in the form of weird antics and pranks, apparently carried out by the ghost of Rudy Cranor. One night, Tom Blasco placed a pile of tablecloths on an empty table and left the room. When he came back, the clothes were on the floor. He picked them up and left again, only to return moments later and find them once again on the floor. This was repeated several times until Blasco finally gave up and left them on the floor. Employees and visiting musicians also reported strange occurrences, like doors opening and closing by themselves, the sounds of footsteps in empty rooms, a drink that had lifted off a table and then dumped in a customer's lap, office equipment that operated on its own, feelings of being poked and prodded by unseen hands, and numerous other bizarre happenings. A frightening event took place in the summer of 1977 when Barbara Laird, a waitress at the club, had an encounter with Rudy himself. She was working one evening and went to the bathroom behind the back office. As she came out, she glanced over the back bar and saw Rudy looking at her. She described what she saw as just a head, hanging there in space, and although she could see through it, the head appeared lifelike. She said that the apparition had snow-white hair, and she had never known, heard about, or had even seen a photograph of the late bartender at the time. The apparition looked at her for a moment and then spoke telling the waitress that one of the owners of the club was going to die. This was not a threat, Laird recalled later, but merely a warning. The waitress ran out of the room in tears, visibly shaken and close to hysterics. Other staff members who saw her that night reported that she was very frightened and she was not a person known for being hysterical or easily frightened. Tom Blasco later stated, that he went back into the room after Laird's encounter and claimed to feel the same bone-chilling cold that he always associated with Rudy's spirit. Needless to say, Blasco and Carmian were more than a little unnerved by the ghost's warning. By this time, they had no doubt the ghost was real and that the club was genuinely haunted. Because of this, they also had no reason to doubt that Barbara Laird's encounter had been real her description of the late Rudy Craner had been too accurate to have been imagined. The two men waited and probably were more careful than usual when doing things like driving to work or climbing ladders. Then, two weeks after the incident, Harold Henderson, one of the original owners of the club, died at the age of 69. He was still the owner of the building itself and was an owner that Rudy would have known during his lifetime. The incident would shake Blasco more than anyone else. He had spent two weeks living in fear for his life, and he felt that it was time to get rid of the ghost if possible. Perhaps Rudy had been trying to be helpful with his warning, but Blasco didn't really care. He contacted a woman he knew was interested in the occult, and she suggested that he ask a priest for help. Blasco was a practicing Catholic, but when he contacted his parish priest, the man declined to become involved. 
he suggested that Blasco pray for Rudy on his own, and Tom spent the next six months carrying a rosary around the club with him. But it didn't help. Rudy was still there. Finally, in August 1979, Blasco attended a high school class reunion and ran into one of his former classmates, Reverend Gary Dilley, a priest who now lived in Fort Worth, Texas. Tom mentioned the problems at the club to Father Dilly, and the priest was intrigued. After some discussion, he agreed to come out to the club and take a look around. He said later that he believed Blasco was sincere about what he said was happening. He had known the man for many years and had never thought of him as a hysterical type of person. After arriving at the club, Father Dilly also sensed something out of the ordinary there. He experienced some unexplained cold chills and felt as if someone was watching him. He said in a later interview, I also had the feeling that someone was trying to communicate with me. The priest questioned several of the club's employees and found that their stories were very similar. He knew they had not had time to compare notes before he spoke with them. He was convinced that something was going on, but he declined to do an exorcism of the club. To do that, the case would require a thorough investigation and permission from the local bishop, which he doubted he would get. Instead, he decided to bless the place and pray there, hoping this would perhaps put Rudy to rest. Father Dilly contacted two other priests to take part in the ceremony, Father John Corradato of Kankakee and Father Gerald Leahy of Griffin High School in Springfield. The three men were quick to point out that they were merely trying to bless the building, to clear out any negative spirits, and to help at least one very restless soul to find peace. The three priests went from room to room in the club, blessing each with holy water and praying. They asked that any negative spirits depart from the building, and they prayed specifically for Rudy Cranor. They entered the room in which he had committed suicide and prayed that his spirit be at rest. So, was that the end of the haunting? Apparently it was. The same people who considered the club to be haunted were now sure that Rudy had departed. The day of the religious ceremony was the last day when anyone was aware of Rudy's presence in the building. It seemed that the prayers and blessings had helped the bartender find his way to the other side. It certainly seemed possible that Rudy might have chosen to stay behind in a place where he had many attachments in life. Perhaps the intervention of the priests was all he needed to be convinced to move on. Once Rudy was gone, some staff members realized they hadn't minded his ghost as much as they had once thought. In a 1980 newspaper interview, Tom Blasco said, In a way, I sort of miss Rudy. We were all fond of him. It's been pretty quiet since the priests were here. Sometimes I wish that I hadn't asked them to come. Missed or not, Rudy finally found some peace and release from his suffering, somewhere on the other side. Rasputin. His true story is a mix of lies and truths. When a man's life story contains plots, controversies, intrigues, and rumors, it's difficult to grasp how everything started and ended. We must rely on experts and books to get to the bottom of the mystery of Rasputin. But how far can we get? We can say with certainty that Grigory Rasputin was one of the most intriguing, yet least understood, historical persons in Russia. He had a strong influence on the Tsar family and his power led to his death. It is said that he was a holy man, a prophet with healing powers, and it seemed almost impossible to kill him. He survived several assassination attempts before he was brutally murdered by a group of conspirators. Was he an evil or misunderstood man? The exact date of birth of Grigory Rasputin is uncertain, but it's assumed that he was born in the late 1860s. He was a child of a peasant family living in Siberia. 
It seems that he was an uneducated boy, as his family did not have the funds or maybe the desire to send young Rasputin to school. According to some historians, Rasputin never learned how to read and write. But author Colin Wilson, who wrote the book Rasputin and the Fall of the Romanovs, stated that Rasputin had little schooling, although his father taught him the rudiments of reading. He could see no point in learning to write. He hated discipline. He preferred fishing or swimming to sitting over books. He never learned to write properly. Letters in his handwriting show an awkward, childish scrawl. In those days, he may have been a typical boy, one who had some minor encounters with the law. In the eyes of Praskova Dubrovina, he was worthy enough to marry, and she bore him five children, though only three survived. Rasputin supported them all by working on the family farm in the early years of their marriage. It was his interest in religion that started him down the road that would lead to fame and eventually his demise. Before Rasputin had the privilege of meeting the Tsar family, he spent many months in a monastery. Although he was referred to as a holy man, a mystic, and the mad monk, he never took the final vows to become a monk. To name him the Mad Monk is incorrect, but that was what his enemies called him anyway. Rasputin made several trips to the Holy Land, sought out religious leaders in his search for God. His strong personality and charisma influenced many who heard him. As his popularity grew, so did his supporters and, eventually, enemies. Rasputin had so many followers that he began to build a little church so he could teach and preach with ease but his view on religion became slightly twisted. Wilson revealed that the Russian mystic became obsessed with asceticism and the idea of pilgrimage. It took Rasputin some years before he came to the attention of Russia's royal family. In 1903, Rasputin, often called the Wanderer, came to St. Petersburg. By now, he was a well-known mystic and faith healer. It was said that he possessed unusual healing powers, He'd healed the family dog of one of the relatives of the Russian Tsar, Nicholas II. News about this extraordinary mystic and the great gifts he held reached the Tsar, who in 1905 decided to invite Rasputin to join his royal court. The Tsar family had a sick child who suffered from hemophilia. Surely Rasputin could help them cure the youngster, they thought. The healing of the young boy is just one of the controversies that surrounded Rasputin. The stories range from him stopping the aspirin being administered to the young lad, to his laying on hands, to kneeling and praying for the boy, and finally to using peasant folk medicine. We may never know what Rasputin actually did, but the child's health did improve, and the young man was cured. It's no wonder, then, that the grateful Tsar and his wife invited Rasputin to stay with them long term. Rasputin became a close friend to the Tsar family, and the royal couple found comfort in his advice and counseling. Fame and jealousy often go hand in hand. Rasputin was not immune to this fact. When Rasputin's rise in influence over the royal family became obvious, it created jealousy in church leaders, government officials, and the elite members of society. Because of this jealousy, there are several stories surrounding Rasputin that may or may not be true. Rasputin suddenly became a target of all possible controversies and accusations. It was said he was a member of the Kylists, a group believing that to get close to God they had to practice debauchery and other sins. His daughter Maria refuted that notion and said that Rasputin rejected the sect and did not like their thinking at all. One vicious rumor had Rasputin in a very lurid affair with the Tsar's wife, Alexandra. Other rumors had him working with the Germans against the Russians and starting a cholera epidemic using imported Canadian apples. There seemed to be no ending to the accusations against Rasputin, but how much was true is difficult to determine today. Wilson reminds all readers interested in Rasputin that original source material is scanty. The revolution came shortly after his death, and the historians of the Soviet government were more interested in denigrating Nicholas II 
than in historical accuracy. Most of the books about Rasputin that were published outside Russia were cheap, sensational biographies that made no pretense of detachment. Despite the lack of proper information, most historians agree that a group of conspirators started to develop a plot how to murder the Russian mystic. One of the main figures in the assassination plot was Prince Felix Yusupov, a Russian aristocrat who married the niece of Tsar Nicholas II. When Rasputin survived several assassination attempts, people got scared, thinking this holy man must be immortal, but they were wrong. In his book, To Kill Rasputin, The Life and Death of Grigory Rasputin, author Andrew Cook describes how Rasputin, on the night of December 29, 1916, was invited to meet some would-be friends who wanted to murder him. Prince Yusupov and the Tsar's first cousin, Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, gave Rasputin poison, but it had no effect on him. Rasputin had eaten all the cakes and drunk two glasses of poisoned wine and nothing has happened, Cook writes. Absolutely nothing. Rasputin was belching and dribbling, but that was about it. The killers shot him several times, but to their astonishment Rasputin survived and fled. But he didn't get far. He was seriously wounded, fell in the snow-clad courtyard, and the great mystic knew death was inevitable. Rasputin died in the Moika Palace. His killers wrapped his body in a carpet and threw it in the Neva River, where it was discovered three days later. When examined by a coroner, it was found that Rasputin had water in his lungs and was alive at the time he was thrown in the water. Russia's great mystic was gone. Some saw it as liberation. Others were sad. But Rasputin's dead voice could still be heard through his prophecy. Shortly before he died, he wrote the Tsar, telling him, If I am killed by common men, you and your children will rule Russia for centuries to come. If I am killed by one of your stock, you and your family will be killed by the Russian people. Rasputin's prophecy came true 15 months later. The whole Tsar family, the Tsar, his wife, and all their children were murdered by assassins during the Russian Revolution. Some suspected one of the daughters survived, Anastasia, and many women stepped forward claiming to be the daughter of the Tsar. No one could provide enough evidence, though. Was Rasputin a mad, evil charlatan, or was he a misunderstood man born ahead of his time? His life is colorful, and his personality captivated the public, then and now. Hundreds of books have been written about Russia's greatest mystic. No one knows his true story. If you want to learn more about Rasputin, read some biographies. But remember, they all present a slightly different story. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In the summer of 2002, I moved into a little apartment in a small town in Massachusetts. With the exception of the previous few months, thanks to lease complications with my former landlord, I had been out of my parents' house for years, but I'd always had roommates. This was my first apartment by myself, 
and I was really looking forward to being alone. It was a cozy first-floor apartment with a private garden entrance at the rear of an old house that had been converted into four apartments, and I loved it. That first night that I moved in was wonderful. My friends had all gone home after beer and pizza, and I was left alone. I had electricity and hot water, but no cable TV or phone for dial-up internet. I took a long, hot shower and read a book until I felt sleepy and then proceeded to enjoy one of the best night's sleep I've ever had. Independence and quiet are wonderful things. The next night, things started to change. As I said, this was an old house, and as such, the closet door in my bedroom didn't close properly unless I lifted the doorknob and hip-checked it closed. Opening it was no picnic either. That night, I again fell asleep with a sense of peace and tranquility. But it didn't last. Sometime in the middle of the night, the closet door slammed open, as if someone had kicked it open from the inside, smacked it into the wall, and slammed it shut again. I know this because it happened many more times over the next few weeks. As you can imagine, I was catapulted out of sleep in a panic. I sat upright, staring at the closed closet door, terrified and too petrified to reach for the light in the dark. I probably sat like that for a good 15 minutes before I could move. Once I got the light turned on, I left it on for the remainder of the night. The closet door continued to do its thing as the weeks went on, accompanied by lights turning on in the middle of the night, doors locking on their own, the stereo doing whatever the heck it wanted, cabinet doors all being opened when I got home from work, and other various things. I was not happy, and I didn't know what to do. One Friday night, a friend came over for dinner, and I told him all about my situation, admitting that I was scared and might need to move out already. He told me not to worry about it and that he would have a little chat with my ghost. I was a little uncomfortable with that, but he did insist. I poured myself a glass of wine and went outside to peer through my bedroom window while my friend sat on the floor in front of my open closet and had what appeared to be a one-sided conversation. After about 15 minutes or so, he closed the closet door and signaled to me that he was finished. He wouldn't tell me what he said, but he assured me that my troubles were over. And they were, for five wonderfully peaceful years. In the summer of 2007, I was working on my computer in my bedroom, listening to music and enjoying the warm breeze through the window, when I heard a loud crash from the other end of the apartment. I ran into the kitchen to find a beautiful old ceramic serving platter that I had left on the counter smashed in the middle of the kitchen floor, about five feet from the counter. That was the end of the peace and quiet. For the next ten months, I endured an ever-increasing amount of activity, which even my friend couldn't do anything about. My boyfriend would no longer stay in my apartment alone for more than five minutes, and other friends often said they felt uncomfortable there, even with others around. In the spring of 2008, I moved to another small town in Massachusetts and haven't experienced anything at all to indicate my current home is haunted. In 1961, A picture was snapped of a young girl who was discovered adrift, alone on a small lifeboat in the waters of the Bahamas. The story of how she ended up there is much more horrifying and bizarre than one can imagine. When Nikolaos Spachadakis, second officer of the Greek freighter Captain Theo, saw Terry Joe Duperalt, he could barely believe his eyes. He had been scanning the waters of the Northwest Providence Channel a strait that divides two major islands of the Bahamas, and one of the thousands of tiny, dancing whitecaps in the distance caught the officer's eye. Among the hundreds of other boats in the channel, he focused on that single dot, 
and realized that it was too large to be a piece of debris, far too small to be a boat that would travel that far out to sea. He alerted the captain, who put the freighter on a collision course for the speck. When they pulled up alongside it, they were shocked to discover a blonde-haired 11-year-old girl floating by herself in a small inflatable lifeboat. One of the crew members took a picture of her squinting into the sun, looking up at the vessel that had saved her. The image made the front page of Life magazine and was shared around the world. But how did this young American child find her way to the middle of the ocean all alone? The story begins when her father, a prominent optometrist from Green Bay, Wisconsin, named Dr. Arthur Duperalt, chartered the luxury yacht the Bluebell from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to the Bahamas for a family trip. He brought with him his wife Jean and his kids, Brian, 14, Terry Joe, 11, and Renee, 7. He also brought his friend and former Marine and World War II veteran Julian Harvey as his skipper, along with Harvey's new wife Mary Dean. By all accounts, the trip was going swimmingly, and there was little friction between the two families throughout the first five days of the journey. On the fifth night of the cruise, however, Terry Joe was awoken by screaming and stamping on the deck above the cabin in which she slept. Talking to reporters later, Terry Joe recalled how she went upstairs to see what it was and, quote, I saw my mother and brother lying on the floor and there was blood all over. She then saw Harvey walking towards her. When she asked what happened, he just slapped her in the face and told her to go down below deck. Terry Jo once more went above deck when the water levels began to rise on her level. She ran into Harvey again and asked him if the boat was sinking, to which he replied, yes. He then asked her if she had seen the dinghy that was moored to the yacht break loose. When she told him she had, he jumped into the waters toward the loose vessel. Left alone, Terry Joe remembered the single life raft aboard the vessel and embarked on the tiny boat out into the ocean. Without food, water, or any covering to protect her from the heat of the sun, Terry Joe spent 84 grueling hours before she was rescued by the Captain Theo. Unbeknownst to Terry Joe, by the time she woke up on November 12th, Harvey had already drowned his wife and stabbed the rest of Terry Joe's family to death. He likely killed his wife to collect on her $20,000 double indemnity insurance policy. When Terry Joe's father witnessed him killing her, he must have killed the doctor and then proceeded to kill the rest of her family. He then sunk the yacht that they were on and escaped on his dinghy with his wife's drowned corpse as evidence. His dinghy was found by the freighter the Gulf Lion and brought to a U.S. Coast Guard site. Harvey told the Coast Guard that the yacht had broken down while he was on the dinghy. He was still with them when he heard that Terry Joe had been discovered. Oh my God, Harvey reportedly stammered when he heard the news. Why, that's wonderful. The next day, Harvey killed himself in his motel room, slitting thigh, ankle, and throat with a double-edged razor. To this day, why Harvey decided to let young Terry Joe Duperalt live is unknown. Some at the time hypothesized that he had some kind of latent desire to be caught, as little else would explain why he would have no qualms killing the rest of her family but mysteriously left Terry Joe Duperalt alive. Whatever the case, this bizarre act of mercy resulted in the media phenomenon of the sea waif that captured the nation. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more 
at WeirdDarkness.com. He is young and intelligent and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge, physically untrained and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival, he seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk is to become a singer or teller of stories. But in Eric Banfeld's case, he must be a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. People around the world make photographs of something very strange, a phenomenon called orbs. Orbs exist, but where do they come from? Are they energy beings? Do they come from outside of physical reality? Although there are many theories of their original source, the orb phenomenon has not yet been fully explained. We do not know what the nature of the orb is, whether they are ghosts, aliens, angels, or perhaps energy beings we know nothing about. The phenomenon is so widespread that it raises a lot of interest among both scientists and ordinary people. The first orbs were observed in flash photography at the beginning of the 20th century, and they were thought to be the film's illumination or camera defects. It turned out, however, that the cameras were getting better all the time, and the orbs were coming out all the time. According to what the most popular theory says, these small, translucent spheres of light visible in the photographs are manifestations of ghosts. The appearance of these orbs is accompanied by a mysterious change in the electromagnetic field that can be measured with an EMF sensor. Created unconsciously, they are thrown out when trying to contact a human to whom they remain invisible. Interestingly, they are perfectly seen by animals and cats are especially sensitive to their presence. Photographs of orbs are usually made in cemeteries or places deemed haunted. They also appear in pictures of funerals, weddings, and family celebrations of a spiritual, meditative nature. Most often, however, we see them on random photos. According to some observations, they appear to announce death or tragedy. The orbs are seen on pictures taken shortly before death, and most often they cover the face of the photographed person. The closer to the date of death, the stain is stronger and clearer. Another theory suggests the orbs are energy balls of unknown origin, and based on research, their activity increases in the vicinity of crop circles. Is it possible that energy generated by crop circles also attract orbs for some unknown reason. Some researchers say orbs show signs of intelligence and want to contact us. Other proponents argue that small, bright globes are nothing but angels who take care of us and are linked to healing processes. Orbs penetrate through matter with equal ease to pass through a human being as well as through the wall they're not visible to the naked eye, they can only be seen through the lens. The nature of the orbs was also taken by serious physicists such as Stanford University professor William Tiller and Professor Klaus Heinemann, Ph.D. in experimental physics from the University of Teubingen, Germany. There is no doubt in my mind that the orbs may well be one of the most significant outside of this reality phenomena mankind has ever witnessed says Professor Klaus Heinemann, who worked for many years in materials science research at NASA, UCLA, and is the co-author of The Orb Project. Will they prove one day that the non-material world exists? 
Orb expert Professor Heinemann has photographed the orbs not only in relation to spiritual events, but he also found appearances of orbs in more commonplace situations of life. Some experiments were directed to yield more information about their speed of motion, expansion and contraction, intelligence, the mechanism of light emission, and differentiation between photographs of light spirits, orbs, and dark spirits. Particularly, attempts of 3D stereo photography of orbs yielded interesting and unexpected results. Cognitive scientist Donald Hoffman, University of California, has suggested we live in a conceptual prison and only see glimpses of reality. Hoffman argues that we only see what is necessary for our survival. If he is correct, orbs could very well exist in our world, only we don't see them very often because they are unimportant in our daily lives, until someone dies, and that's when they manifest themselves and we can perceive this mysterious phenomenon. Can biocentrism, Robert Lanza's theory of everything, shed more light on the orb phenomenon? According to the biocentrism theory that is based on ideas of quantum physics, life and biology are the central pieces to being, reality, and the cosmos. It explains how life creates the universe rather than the other way around. As some already know, the multiverse is a theory in which our universe is not the only one, but states that many universes exist parallel to each other. These distinct universes within the multiverse theory are called parallel universes. Could orbs be energy beings that reside in either a parallel universe, another dimension, or an invisible world next to our own? Could this explain why these entities manifest themselves to us only occasionally? There are no solid answers to these questions because there is still so much we don't know about the nature of our reality. Up until a few months ago, I lived in an apartment in Manhattan with a roommate. We moved last summer and everything seemed fine. For a while. It's hot in August, so we had the AC window units running at night. It starts to cool off in September, so we turned off the AC and it was quiet at night. The first incident I noticed was when I heard what sounded like rustling in my dresser drawers. Because I'm a rational person, I dismissed it and told myself I was half asleep and that it was nothing. In the days and weeks after, I felt something jump on my bed in the middle of the night and walk around. But again, I ignored the incident and in my half-asleep state of mind thought it was my roommate's cat. Then I remembered that my door was shut and the cat could not be in my room. This happened several times, so I knew it wasn't just in my head, but I didn't mention it to my roommate because I didn't want us to scare each other. In October, I got a dog, a sweet little chihuahua that was very quiet and never barked or made noise. In the middle of the night, she would suddenly wake up, extremely alert, and stare at my bedroom door, growling and snarling. I couldn't do anything to calm her down, and she never reacted that way to the cat that was also still in the apartment. This happened almost every night, and I still hadn't mentioned anything to my roommate. One night we were at a bar, having a few drinks, and I decided I had to tell her what was going on. I told my roommate about the dresser noises, the footsteps on my bed, and my dog growling at nothing in the middle of the night. She looked horrified and told me the exact same things happened to her. Strange noises, feeling things on her bed when the cat was nowhere to be found, and the cat acting very strangely, staring at things and suddenly running away to hide. Once we had completely freaked each other out, we were on high alert, exactly what I'd wanted to avoid, and things started to get worse. I continued to hear weird noises and feel steps on my bed. My dog continued to growl at night. Then, one night I felt a lot of pressure on my chest, like someone or something was pressing on it. I couldn't breathe. We also had two incidents where my roommate and I were both home, sitting at opposite ends of the apartment when a bottle of vodka tipped over for no reason. 
My roommate witnessed this, and it was the Crystal Head Vodka, a skull-shaped bottle that is short and bottom-heavy, not something that randomly falls over. The bottle of vinegar also crashed to the floor and shattered for no apparent reason. The last thing I can remember happening is the towel incident. One day I went to the shower and left a towel hanging on a rack right next to the shower. I'm certain it was there because I used it to wipe my eyes while showering. However, when I got out of the shower, the towel was lying on the floor at the opposite end of the room. There was no way for me to accidentally drop the towel and then toss it ten feet across the room. I kid you not, I was so terrified that I wound up going to a church to get holy water and use it to bless the apartment every week. Nothing happened after that. The dog stopped barking. No more objects fell over. No more footsteps on the bed. Now for the strangest part. I had googled my address many times to see if anything bad had happened there, but I never found anything. When I finally moved out, I received a text from my mom saying that she hadn't wanted to tell me while I lived there, but that she'd googled my address and came across an article about a New York writer who had lived in my apartment and committed suicide. Not just the building, but my exact unit. I couldn't believe she had kept this secret for over three years, but I'm glad I didn't know and that my roommate and I were not insane. I am so happy I moved out. Situated in the heart of England, Tutbury Castle is situated on wooded slopes overlooking the winding River Dove, with spectacular views across the plain of the Dove to the beautiful Derbyshire Hills. Occupied since the Stone Age, the castle is first recorded in 1071 as one of the new castles built to stamp the authority of the Norman conquerors across the Midlands. Since then, the castle has played an important part in English history on many occasions, both in warfare and in peace. The castle is best known as one of the prisons of Mary Queen of Scots, who was incarcerated there on four occasions. It was here that she became involved in the plot that ultimately led to her bloody execution at Fotheringhay. Tutbury has a long tradition of ghostly happenings, and here are just a few of the most famous ones. The Keeper Wearing a full suit of armor and behaving in a manner that might best be described as authoritative, this ghostly figure has been seen stepping out in John of Gaunt's gateway and bellowing, Get thee hence! Although last sighted in daylight about four years ago by a visitor who complained that an idiot of an, an actor had told him to get over the fence, recent increases in paranormal activity might suggest that another visit could be imminent. When it was pointed out that no enactors were on site that day and that similar ghostly apparitions had been reported by other unsuspecting visitors, the response was, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in ghosts. Mary, Queen of Scots Tutbury was Mary's most despised prison. She suffered much at Tutbury and was at the castle as a captive of Elizabeth I on four occasions. She was seen all in white by some members of Her Majesty's services. In 2004, at approximately midnight, she was seen standing at the top of the South Tower by a group of men in the form of a figure dressed in a pure white gown. When they saw her, they all just laughed, believing the curator was just teasing them by putting on an Elizabethan gown as a joke. When it was pointed out that curator Leslie Smith does not have a white gown, and neither does any other Elizabethan enactor working at the castle, the men were profoundly disturbed by this sighting. She was also seen rapidly crossing the grass one hot afternoon in 1984 by a serving Marine Recently, there have been a number of sightings of Mary, especially between 10.15 p.m. and 11 p.m. A figure dressed in black is seen standing at the window of the Great Hall as cars leave the castle. In May and June this year, 
she was not only seen by senior members of staff, who are usually quite dismissive of such reports, but also by archaeologists participating in a seasonal dig at the castle. Film and TV Many paranormal TV shows have been recorded at Tutbury Castle. For ghost lovers, the castle was featured on Most Haunted and The World's Biggest Ghost Hunt. In September 2005 and April 2006, Tutbury Castle hosted the National Most Haunted Convention. In October 2004, Tutbury Castle welcomed 2,000 people on a one-night ghost hunting event. Some visitors come from as far afield as Paris to spend a night in Tutbury. Regular ghost hunts, including the popular Haunted Happenings events, are still held at the castle. It all started when I was about eight or nine years old. Actually, I guess it may have been earlier, but that's around the first memory I have of it. See, I've had sleep paralysis as long as I can remember, although it's rare now that I'm an adult. Most people that I have told about this have assumed I'm just scared of the dark or have bad nightmares, but that's not it, although I am and I do. I have always had vivid dreams. When I was dreaming, I was there. I could see, smell, hear, and feel. I was also a very adept, lucid dreamer, having the choice to affect my dreams at will. That didn't work on nightmares, though, and I often had nightmares before these episodes. Horribly vivid nightmares almost every night. Dreams of falling, fire, death, being alone in empty spaces, but mostly monsters. Those were the worst. Some of them were your classic 80s slasher film icons, Jason, Freddy, etc. I think my mom let me watch those movies a little too young, along with reading Stephen King, but she is still my hero. Those usually involved running and hiding while being in a strange place, usually creepy abandoned buildings or out in the woods, the monsters that didn't come from movies were way worse, though. Dreams come from your subconscious, supposedly, so I guess somehow my mind created them. Although as a child, it seemed like they were from the depths of hell. Twisted, grotesque things, sometimes vaguely resembling a human form with missing limbs or too many, hideous faces with skin missing or eyes hanging out of sockets, some were not human at all, however. Giant creatures with wings and razor-sharp claws and teeth. Black shadows with red eyes that would just stand in the corner and watch me while I went about mundane tasks, like homework or watching TV. Sometimes I would wake up before they got me. Not always. People say you're not supposed to die in dreams, but I have many, many times. I have fallen and hit the ground. I've burned up in fire, been stabbed and sliced. I've even had a dream where I was at a funeral that turned out to be mine. I didn't go back to sleep that night. Well, I'm not really scared of the dark, per se, or even scared of the nightmares. I'm afraid of waking up in the dark. Let me explain what a typical night was for me when I was younger and maybe you can start to understand. I would fall asleep in my bedroom with the TV on, mostly for light. Sound would be just loud enough to make out what they were saying. Sometimes I'd fall asleep on the couch with the light and sound coming from my parents' room before I had a TV in my own room. Then the dream would start. The worst one ever, which I had often, I don't know how rare reoccurring dreams are, but I feel I got more than my fair share, it would start with me waking up in my own bed. I would be viewing as though from my own eyes, rather than third person, as a lot of dreams were. I would look over at my alarm clock and it would say 3.33 a.m., always. Then the fear would start. I knew what was coming, but powerless to prevent it. 
I would slowly place my feet on the floor and stand up while stretching and yawning. I'd start to head for the bathroom. Not sure how I know the bathroom was my destination as I never made it there, and I would trip on something. I crash on the floor, hitting my nightstand, causing my alarm clock to fall on my head and bounce to the floor. So I'm lying there, cursing myself and looking under my bed. There's nothing there, and I mean nothing. The meager light in my room should penetrate at least a few inches into the darkness, but it's like a wall of black, shadow, and empty void, and I freeze with fear. Suddenly, two small orbs of fire appear, directly eye-level with me, the eyes of some unknown being staring into my soul. Its breath was the worst part. I would see it and smell it at the same time. I only know it was breathing because it came out in a fog, like when you're outside in winter, only it wasn't cold in my room, and the breath upon my face was cold enough to chill me to the bone. And the stench. Ugh. It was as though someone took dead animal carcasses and dirty diapers and lit them on fire with a thousand matches, like sulfur or burnt hair. My mind would be screaming, run, hide! But my body is frozen. I'm hyper aware. I can feel every muscle in my body tense up in preparation, but nothing happens. Then it grabs me. I see nothing, no limbs of any sort, but I'm being dragged under the bed. Then I am in total blackness. I can feel its disgusting breath on my neck and hear my heartbeat, but my sense of sight has totally abandoned me. I don't feel arms around me specifically, but I am being held there. It feels like someone has wrapped a blanket made of flesh around me but it is stronger than I am and holds me completely still. Then I feel its tongue slowly lick from my neck to my ear as though tasting my fear. In a voice I can only describe as broken glass soaking in blood, gravelly and grating but wet, it whispers, What do you like about laying under the bed? That's when I snap out of it. I struggle and fight, swinging my elbows and kicking my legs hard as I can, eventually loosening the creature's grip, and I would wake up. Here's where the real fun begins. I would be completely frozen, sometimes to the point where I could not even open my eyes. Sometimes that would be all, just frozen for a minute or two, then I would snap out of it. I'm getting a little freaked out even writing about it, the memories are that vivid as it comes out. Other times the nightmares followed me. I remember once I was lying there frozen, trying to force my eyes to close when I heard that same thick, gravelly voice say, Come back under the bed. The games were just starting. I couldn't turn my head to look toward the sound. Not sure I would have even if I could, but I could feel its cold breath on my ear. I guess I must have screamed, although I don't remember doing so, because my mom ran into the room and turned on the light. I swear I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye melt into the floor, heading back under the bed. She checked, assured me there was nothing under the bed. I still don't know what to believe. According to the therapists and counselors I have talked to, I was experiencing visual and auditory hallucinations common to sleep paralysis. They don't know how real it was, though. When I would wake up in bed, once able to move, I would jump off my bed, making sure to stay well away from the edge, run to my parents' bedroom and crawl into bed with them. Sadly, until I was about 14, Oftentimes, though, I would not wake up in my bed as I had fallen asleep. Sometimes, after that specific dream, I would wake up on the floor next to my bed, which was the worst, especially if the paralysis kicked in, which was often. I've woken up on the couch, on the floor in my parents' room, on the kitchen floor, in the empty bathtub, even on the porch. 
On these occasions, I would sometimes find scratches and cuts on my body, often small, although once I had a six-inch gouge across my rib cage. Still have the scar. The therapist said this was due to sleepwalking and running into things. My grandmother had a very different view of things. I loved my grandma. She definitely wasn't your regular sweet old lady. My grandmother had a deep appreciation for the occult. When I told her about my dreams, she crossed herself and did that weird little evil eye hand gesture. I asked why she was freaking out. My dear, 3.33 is a time of evil, she explained. 3 is a number of Satan. 3 a.m. is the witching hour, dear, when the veil between realms is thin and reality can be warped. It was more likely that it was an actual demon trying to drag you to the underworld. You're lucky to have survived the attacks. She also told me that I wasn't sleepwalking, as the therapist suggested, but actually in another, I guess you'd say, alternate plane or dimension or even the underworld. We always thought she was a little crazy. Now, I'm not so sure. I wish she was still alive to help my family. Recently, my seven-year-old son has been waking up in the middle of the night, right around 3.30 a.m., screaming about the monster with blue fire eyes. I was holding him after one recent episode, telling him it was a dream and he will be okay. He kept repeating the word, no. When I got him to calm down a little, I asked why he was saying no. He said he doesn't want to play under the bed. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B horror movie or so bad it's good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. For something different, here's a Dark Archives creepypasta. Three times each day, I take our small dog for a walk. The way we go varies as I spend the time thinking about ideas for this and that, and Millie wanders around the village with me in tow. She knows where she wants to go and I just follow. We started out early one morning during the winter and made our meandering way from tree to tree as she smelt around for every dog which had passed that way recently, leaving little drops of pee everywhere herself. If you share your home with a dog, you'll know exactly what I mean. It often seems to me that she must have had an invisible tank somewhere, but as I say, you know what I mean. This particular morning, it had started to snow at first light. The ground was covered with a soft carpet of white, and parked cars looked like small mounds on wheels. We wandered around and finally came to a small alley called Monk's Walk. In the olden days, monks from the ancient archbishop's palace had passed this way on their way to their own small chapel a mile or two away from the village. It was a daily penance to walk barefoot to prayers across the sharp flint-strewn paths, and they made the journey several times a day. Millie loves this pathway. It opens out to a good-sized grassy area where she can run free, safe from the busy road. It also has a neatly laid-out children's playground with a good selection of swings, slides, and roundabouts, as well as a small picnic area with wooden tables and benches. The day was bitter with cold, the gray skies above threatening more snow before the morning was out. 
I pulled up the collar of my sheepskin coat and thrust my gloved hands deep into the pockets. It really was cold. Watching Millie running around, I mused on how cold her paws must feel to her, although it apparently had no effect on her enjoyment of being out of our nice warm house with its underfloor heating. I was looking forward to getting back home myself and settling down with breakfast, coffee, and a newspaper, then jotting down a few more words of a screenplay I'm working on. I did the pooper scooping thing, we like to keep the village neat and clean, and made my way over to the bin at the picnic area. As I approached the tables, I became aware that a small child was sitting on one of the benches, facing me across the table with her chin supported by her hands. She was very nicely dressed in a fashionable and good-quality coat of a style popular with those who can afford to shop at the likes of Harrods and Selfridges in London. Of course, here in a good middle-class Kentish village, this was no surprise, as quite frankly, one needs to be wealthy to live here and most folk in the village commute to their work in London. The surprise was that she was here at all, sitting at a picnic table covered in snow and early in the morning, far too early to be on her way to the village school. And anyway, I knew most of the local kids at the school. Their parents were my neighbors and my friends. She looked up at me from under the hood of her coat and smiled. "'It's a lovely morning,' she said. "'I love the snow.' Well, yes, I said, it is a lovely morning, but much too cold to be sitting here in the snow so early. Is your mummy here with the dog? Mummy's gone, she said, with a kind of finality in her voice. But Daddy said, we will all be together soon. Is Daddy here then? I asked, looking about to see if I could see him anywhere. No, she said, Daddy went too. Look, I said, I don't like the idea of you getting very cold here, and it's before breakfast time for me. Have you had breakfast? No, we came straight here, she replied. It is very cold, though. Well, listen, I said. I live in that house just over on the corner, but I do not think I should take you there myself. You really should not go anywhere with a stranger. She looked at me, and I noticed that small tears were streaming from her eyes. She looked so tiny, too, around seven or eight years old, I guessed. "'I do want to see Mummy,' she said, and looked down sadly at the snow-covered tabletop, sinking slowly onto the surface and covering her face with her gloved hands. "'I'll call my wife,' I said. "'She'll come straight over, and we'll all go back to sort you out. You cannot stay here in this weather on your own. Do you live in the village?' "'Oh, yes, we've always lived here,' she said. I called my wife on the mobile phone, and she replied straight away. Okay, I'm on my way, she said. Two minutes. Do I need to bring anything? Just put the kettle on, I replied. Looks like she might enjoy some hot chocolate and toast with jam. We should really call the police. I think we should, she said. But let's wait until she's warm and is eaten. We might get more sense out of her then. My wife's on the way, I told the child. And, you know, I don't know your name. I like your dog. Is it a boy dog or a girl dog? My name is Millie. Was she playing a little game with me now, I thought? Surely she had heard me calling Millie's name earlier, but no, I had not called Millie at all. I was sunk in my thoughts and Millie had been happy with her sniffing around. No words had been spoken until I saw the girl. That's a lovely name. It's also the name of my dog, a little girl dog. A moment later, my wife arrived and said hello to the child. I think we should go to our house for a while to warm up and have a hot drink and some jammy toast while we sort you out, she said. Come on, it's nice and warm in the kitchen. Can Lizzie come too? asked the girl. And for the first time, I noticed a small bundle next to her on the bench. No problem, bring her along, she can warm up too. My wife picked up the seven-year-old, telling me to bring her doll along home with me and Millie the dog, who was now running around like a crazy thing, or as we say, having a mad half hour. I grabbed Millie as she raced past and put her back on the lead. Reaching down to the bench, I then picked up the bundle and instantly realized it was a living baby, although very quiet and its skin pinky blue with the cold. 
I dropped the dog lead and stood on it, leaving my hand free to open the buttons of my sheepskin coat as I tucked the baby inside against my body for warmth. I flicked the lead up with my foot and caught it, starting to jog home. I could see my wife and the little girl entering the house across the road as I closed the gate to the playground. By the time I arrived back a minute or two later, my wife had Millie sitting on the sofa, holding a hot water bottle to her chest under her open coat. She still wore the pretty gloves and the hood was still up on her head. Did you bring Lizzie? she asked. Of course I did. I thought Lizzie was your doll. Don't be silly, she said crossly. Lizzie's my sister. Daddy says she's an angel, and me too, of course. Now look, what we need to do now is, firstly, to get both of you warm and with some nourishment inside of you. Then we can talk about what to do next. You look completely perished with the cold, and Lizzie is still wrapped up inside my coat here, warming up. My wife looked at me. Did you say you have a real baby there, not a doll? Yes. I've only glanced at her, though. I thought it was more important to get her warm as fast as I could. We must be quick. Go and open up the bed, and we'll put both of them in it while we get something ready for them to eat. It's probably still warm, but wrap a hot water bottle and a towel to go close to the baby. Within another couple of minutes, Millie was warm in bed, and my wife was opening the small bundle of blanket around Lizzie. My God! This baby's only a couple of months old! It is so still. We, we need to get some help here straight away. Call the hospital for an ambulance. I raced downstairs. My phone had been left on the kitchen table and made the emergency call. Then I called the local police station and asked for someone to call around, quickly outlining the circumstances to the sergeant on duty. With this done, I made a pot of coffee, grabbed cups, etc., and went back upstairs. My wife was cuddling the baby to her with a soft, warm blanket and the hot water bottle. Look at this child's face, she said, and I came closer. The baby's color had improved. In fact, the pallor of her skin had vanished, transformed into a kind of intense radiance. She now made small noises and movements, and as I looked, opened her eyes and gazed at me as small babies do, almost as though seeing right through you. Her eyes were as dark as obsidian, with a glowing shine like polished shell and with tiny pupils of silver. Her gaze ran through me like a hot sword. I felt a strong attraction to her and the need to keep her warm and safe. My attention shifted to Millie, tucked tightly in the warm bed, and as I looked, she turned her head towards me and smiled. Until now, my concern had been for her well-being as a small child alone in the cold of a winter morning, but now I received a feeling like being in an envelope of love as her eyes met mine. She, too, had the dark eyes of her baby sister, as deep as metallic pools, with an iridescent sheen. They attracted my gaze as a magnet attracts iron. Thank you, was all she said, and seemed to slip into a deep sleep. My wife tucked the baby in beside her under the covers and then sat down on the bottom of the bed watching them both. These are strange kids. I want to help them. They need our help. I can feel it within me. Millie the dog came into the room and lay down under the chair in the corner. I kissed my wife and went downstairs to wait for the police and ambulance, taking my hot coffee with me. Outside, the snowfall had increased, the fields and garden now covered by an unbroken blanket of snow. Within fifteen minutes, there was a knock on the door. The snow had stopped and sun now glinted off of the shimmering, icy whiteness of the day. A police car was parked at the corner of the road, and a young female constable stood at the door. We said hello, and I told her about the children as we climbed the stairs together. In the bedroom, my wife was asleep on the bed. The dog was asleep on the floor. The bed was empty. Just the two tiny depressions told the tale of its recent contents. Of the child and the baby, there was no sight. I waked my wife, who looked startled and shocked as she came to consciousness. Where are my angels? was all she said, and seemed to slump asleep again. The dog whimpered slightly under the chair and a deep sense of sadness pervaded the room. The children had gone. 
The policewoman quickly took charge, woke my wife, and started to question us about the happenings of the morning. The siren of the ambulance just caught our ears in the far distance. As she made her notes, we looked around the house from room to room, opening cupboards and closets and wardrobes as we went. Nothing was left to search. The children had vanished as though they had never existed. We turned our search to outside the house, but still nothing could be found. The blanket of snow was a perfect covering. The only marks in its unbroken surface were the footsteps of the policewoman, left as she approached the door. Above us, two tiny birds fluttered their wings gently as they flew away from the chimney pot toward the horizon and the rising sun. We returned into the house and waited for the ambulance, the lady police officer waiting at the door while I dashed upstairs to comfort my wife as I woke her up. She was very distressed at the news of the missing children. I now needed the ambulance for her. She looked drained and ill. A few moments later it arrived, the blue lights glinting across the misty windows of the bedroom as its wheels crunched through the deep snow. The two medics were both kind and attentive to my wife, and she soon felt better. They listened to our story with interest. Can you describe the children, we were asked. We gave as full a description as we could of the clothing, the appearance, and the state of the two young things, as well as our small conversation with the girl. We went to look at the playground, covered in snow, with just the footsteps of my wife, myself, and our dog now just vaguely evident as depressions under the silky fall of later snow. The only evidence of the children was the faint marks of elbows left in the snow on the tabletop and the patch on the bench where the bundle had been. As we returned to the house, the ambulanceman whispered in my ear, "'I'm not a religious man,' he said, "'but I believe you've been touched by God today. That's all I'll say. I should really say nothing at all. I'm on duty, and the care of the living is what I'm paid for.' He would say no more. We were interviewed again by the police a day or two later. They took descriptions but seemed uninterested in the happening, putting it down to either a daydream or some condition of exhaustion. They did not say we were lying to get attention, but that was the underlying gist of the interview. Months later, we ran into the ambulance medic whilst queuing in a market. We chatted for a while and he asked how we were. He mentioned the children and asked about their eyes. My daughter was interested in your story, he told us. She had a similar experience with a lost child, a little child with dark eyes. The child vanished too, and nothing could be found to prove it had existed. He gazed into my eyes. My daughter has had nothing but a beautiful life ever since helping that child with the deep and meaningful eyes. She believes that she and her family have been visited by an angel. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange things were afoot in Pennsylvania in the early 20th century. A brutal murder in 1928 began a hex scare in the region, turning the authorities and the general public against what had always been seen as a common custom, the folk magic practice of powwowing. Prior to the bloody crime, the belief in and practice of folk magic was seen as nothing more than a quaint holdover from less sophisticated times. After the murder, though, it became a threat. Practitioners were no longer seen as backward or ignorant. Now they were dangerous. 
The folk medicine that had been used for centuries was now a false treatment that kept people from getting the real medical care they needed. There was little room for superstition and hex doctors in the modern world. To city folk, it seemed impossible to believe that anyone still believed in magic in the modern world of the 1920s, but among the back roads, farms, and hollows of rural Pennsylvania, magic was alive and well. Pennsylvania hex magic dated back to the earliest days of the colony, linked largely to the Pennsylvanian, German, or Dutch as they were often called, immigrants and their descendants. The German settlers held strongly to elements of their culture and blended customs of the old and the new world to form a distinct identity. Even their language became a unique dialect. Though there were a great many different religious denominations among the German settlers, there was a common tradition of folk magic that was practiced by all, with the exception of the plain Dutch, such as the Amish, who rejected the practice. For large numbers of these Germans, the belief in folk magic was entwined with their Christian beliefs. At one end of the folk magic scale was powwowing, which had nothing to do with the Native American ceremonial practice of the same name. Powwowers performed magical religious folk healing and drew their healing power from God. Generally, powwowers provided cures and relief from illnesses, protection from evil, and the removal of hexes and curses. They also located lost objects, animals, and people, foretold the future, and provided good luck charms. To carry out their practices, they used charms, amulets, incantations, prayers, and rituals. It was generally believed that anyone could powwow, but members of certain families were especially adept at it. These families passed their traditions down from generation to generation. At the other end of the scale was hexerai, or witchcraft. Practitioners of black magic drew their power from the devil or other ungodly sources. The witch harassed neighbors and committed criminal acts with supernatural powers. Sometimes witches were called hex doctors. The term hex doctor can be confusing because it can imply many things. At times, the term was applied to powwowers who were also knowledgeable in the ways of hexerai and were skilled at battling witches and removing curses. These hex doctors fell into a sort of gray area between a witch and a powwower. Sometimes they cast hexes for a price or out of revenge. It was not uncommon for someone to seek out one hex doctor to remove the curse of another. For many Pennsylvania Dutch, and certainly for outsiders, powwowers and witches could not easily be placed into categories. There were many who labeled the use of any folk magic as witchcraft that was strictly forbidden by their religious beliefs. Powwowers and hex doctors often worked against one another, with the common person caught in the middle. It was in this setting that folk magic flourished for more than two centuries. Witches targeted their victims in many ways. Since Hexerai was based around a farming society, many of the witches' attacks were directed at animals and crops. They were often blamed when cows did not produce milk, when seemingly healthy animals mysteriously died, or when crops failed. When witches went after humans, they used a variety of torments. They were commonly suspected of causing illnesses, especially conditions that lingered and caused a person to waste away over time. A witch could also use spells to launch invisible attacks, causing seizures or fits, the sensation of being pricked or stabbed, or the feeling of being choked or strangled. Witches could also cause a run of bad luck for any individual that they attacked. The witch could even appear in the form of an animal like a black cat so that they could move about undetected and harass their victims. Needless to say, just about any type of misfortune could be blamed on a witch. In addition to spoken words, the written word was also used for magic. Written amulets and charms were common, and many Pennsylvania Germans carried them on their person. Amulets usually included a written version of a protective charm and perhaps verses from the Bible. The paper they were written on was usually folded into triangles. If not carried personally, such amulets might be hung in a house or barn. 
ritualized objects were also used. These objects were actually mundane items, but they often acquired a special purpose. Sometimes the objects would be used as a surrogate for the afflicted or for the disease itself. Much of German folk magic depends on the principles of contagion and transference. Basically, the idea is that the evil or the disease is contagious and can be transferred away from the afflicted person and into an object. The object could then be disposed of in a prescribed manner to keep the contagion from spreading. Traditionally, this kind of magic is known as sympathetic magic, and it often worked, as long as the person afflicted truly believed that it would. Since the powwowers and hex doctors depended on charms, formulas, and incantations that were passed down through their families, they often collected them into recipe books, which contained the collective knowledge of a family line of powwowers. By the middle 1800s, these homemade volumes were joined by published volumes that came into common usage. Folk healers had always invoked and used the Bible in their magic, but they increasingly supplemented their knowledge with sources published by other powwowers. The most famous and widely read of these books was compiled by a powwower named John George Homan in 1819. Homan was a German immigrant who settled on a farm in Berks County, Pennsylvania as a side business. He published broadsides and books about the occult and medicine aimed at the local German population. In time, he published the most widely read grimoire, or Book of Magic, in America. The compilation of spells, charms, prayers, remedies, and folk medicine was called Der Lang Verbogene Freund, or The Long Lost Friend. It was the first book of powwow magic to achieve wide circulation. It has been in print in either German or English continuously since 1820. Aside from being a collection of charms and recipes, the book itself became a talisman. In what was an example of a resoundingly successful early marketing ploy, buyers of the book were told they would be protected from harm merely by carrying it. In the front of each edition was an inscription that read, Whoever carries this book with him is safe from all enemies, visible and invisible, and whoever has this book with him cannot die without the holy corpse of Jesus Christ, nor drown in any water, nor burn up in any fire, nor can any unjust sentence be passed upon him, so help me. The bulk of the book consisted of remedies and charms to cure common illnesses, fevers, burns, toothaches, and other ailments. It also contained recipes for beer and molasses, and even had a charm for catching fish. Many of the charms in the book were meant to provide protection from physical harm from weapons, fire, witches, and thieves. It also provided instructions on how to keep animals in a certain location, heal livestock and cattle, and even cure rabid animals. The long-lost friend soon became the primary reference for anyone attempting to understand the practice of powwow and it gained a place of honor on almost every powwowers and hex doctor's shelf. As an opposite number of the helpful charms of the long-lost friend was the far more dangerous book of witchcraft, the sixth and seventh book of Moses. Drawn from the tradition of European grimoires and ceremonial magic, the sixth and seventh book of Moses were purported to have been written by Moses himself and allegedly contained secret knowledge that could not be included in the Bible. Described as two separate books, they are almost always published together in one volume, first appearing in Pennsylvania in 1849. The book soon gained an evil reputation among the German population and those who were familiar with its lore. It was associated with hexing because the text provided instructions on how to conjure and control spirits and demons, it also contained spells and incantations that were beneficial to the user, as well as spells that would duplicate some of the biblical plagues of Egypt, turn a staff into a serpent, and other miraculous happenings. Much of the volume is made up of reproduced symbols that were allegedly copied from old woodcuts. Some copies were printed, at least partially, with red ink. A few hand-copied editions were alleged to exist that had been written in blood. Though hex doctors frequently acquired the book to enhance their reputations, merely owning the volume was believed to be dangerous, and if a hex doctor actually read it, 
That could be fatal. Reading the book was believed to attract the attention of the devil or at the very least cause the reader to become so obsessed with the book that they could do nothing but read it. The only way to break the obsession, should such a thing occur, was to read the entire book in reverse, starting at the end and working back to the beginning. To modern readers, all of the stories and claims of spells, hexes, magic books, and incantations may sound rather silly, but rest assured they were all common traditions of the Pennsylvania Dutch country of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It might sound hard for us to believe today, but people at that time and place readily accepted such ideas. And that turned out to be the most crucial point of the Raymeyer hex murder. Those involved truly believed in magic. They believed that it worked and could ruin their lives. And they would do anything to try and stop that from happening. The hex murder, the strange killing of Nelson Raymeyer, captivated the people of the region and sold newspapers across the country. The story began with a young powwower named John Blymere, who was born in 1895 and learned the art of German folk magic at a young age. His family had been powwowers for at least three generations and probably longer. Although he did poorly in school, Blymere established a good reputation as a healer in York County. Starting at the age of seven, he began providing healing remedies and cures. Despite his early success, though, he began to believe that there was a shadow hanging over him. One day, as he was leaving the cigar factory where he worked, an apparently rabid dog began running toward some of his fellow workers. Blymere approached the dog and spoke some words of a spell. The dog's mouth allegedly stopped foaming and the animal became subdued. Blymere patted its head and the animal followed him excitedly for several blocks. The other workers were amazed at the dog's apparent cure, but soon after, Blymere's luck began to turn bad. He soon became ill, and he started to believe that another practitioner of folk magic had placed a hex on him, possibly out of jealousy. He soon found himself unable to eat, sleep, or work his powwow magic. Blymere used several of his own magical charms to try and remove the hex, but he was unsuccessful. It was difficult to remove a hex if one did not know the identity of the witch who placed it. Then, one night, as he lay in his bed trying to sleep, the answer came to him. Just as the clock struck midnight, an owl outside hooted seven times. It was then that the idea came to Blymere that he had been hexed by the spirit of his great-grandfather Jacob, who had been a powwower and the seventh son of a seventh son. Since he could not fight back against a spirit, he decided he would move away from his ancestral home and the cemetery where his great-grandfather was buried, hopefully breaking the spell. It seemed to work, and soon Blymere's luck began to improve, at least for a time. In addition to his work as a folk healer, Blymere performed a variety of odd jobs, He soon met a young woman named Lily, and they married. The couple had two children, but both died in infancy. The youngest only lived for three days. These tragic occurrences led Blymere to once again believe that he had been hexed. Unable to determine the source of the new hex, he turned to the powwowers for help. One of them was a man named Andrew Lenhart, who convinced him that the source of the hex was someone that he knew well. Blymere became suspicious of everyone around him, even his wife. Lily had reason to fear for her safety because in 1922, one of Lenhart's other clients murdered her husband after receiving similar information. The client, Sally Jane Hagee, shot her husband Irving in bed after Lenhart was hired to drive the witches from her home. Sally did not believe the treatment worked and was in terrible physical pain. She finally snapped one day killing her husband and later committed suicide in jail. After consulting lawyers, Lily was able to obtain a judge's order to have Blymere committed to an insane asylum. The doctors determined that he was obsessed with hexes and magic and needed to go to the asylum for treatment. Soon after, Lily filed for divorce and it was granted. Blymere didn't remain locked up for long. 
48 days after he was committed, he simply walked out the door one day and vanished. No one even bothered to look for him. Blymere went back to work at the cigar factory in 1928. While he was there, he met two other people who also believed that they were suffering because of someone who had hexed them. One of them, 14-year-old John Curry, was trapped in an abusive household and felt that a malevolent force was causing the trouble at home. Another man who believed he had been hexed was a farmer named Milton Hess. Hess and his wife Alice had been successful and prosperous until 1926, when a series of unfortunate events began at their farm. Crops failed, cows stopped producing milk, and they lost a large amount of money. The entire family believed that they had been hexed by someone, but they didn't know who it could be. The talk of hexes reinforced Blymere's own belief in spells, and he became terrified by the idea that someone was out to get him. He began to consult other powwowers again, attempting to track down the source of the lingering hex. Blymere turned to a well-known powwower in the region named Nellie Knoll, the so-called River Witch of Marietta. The elderly woman identified the source of Blymere's hex as a member of the Raymeyer family. When Blymere asked which of them had cursed him, she told him to hold out his hand. She placed a dollar bill on his palm and then removed it. When Blymere looked at his hand, an image appeared. It was the face of Nelson Raymeyer, an old powwower whom Noel referred to as the Witch of Raymeyer's Hollow. Blymere had known Raymeyer, a distant relative, since he was a small child. When Blymere had been five years old, he became seriously ill. His father and grandfather, unable to cure him, took the child to Raymeyer, who healed him. Unable to understand why Raymeyer wished him harm, Blymere went to see Noel again. She confirmed that it was Raymeyer who had hexed him and added that he was also responsible for the curses on John Curry and Milton and Alice Hess. Blymere told the other two men what he had learned and also revealed a solution for ending all of the hexes. Noel had stated that the men needed to take Raymeyer's copy of The Long Lost Friend and a lock of his hair and bury them six feet underground. Blymere and Curry decided to go together to Raymeyer's Hollow and obtain the needed items. On November 26, they were driven by Hess's oldest son, Clayton, to the Hollow. They stopped at the home of Raymeyer's former wife, Alice, who said that Nelson could be found at his own home, which was about a mile down the road. The men went to Raymeyer's door, and Blymere asked to speak with him for a few minutes. He later said that the older man was much larger and meaner looking than Blymere remembered. They went into the parlor, and Blymere asked him questions about the long-lost friend and other elements of powwowing, never mentioning, of course, the true reason why he and Curry had come. After talking for a while, the men realized that it was late, and Raymeyer offered to let them sleep downstairs. They agreed, and while Raymeyer slept, they looked for his copy of the spell book, but were unable to find it. They debated on whether or not to try and obtain a lock of his hair, but finally decided that Raymeyer was too big for them to hold down while they cut his hair. The pair left in the morning after agreeing that they needed more help. Blymere told Milton Hess that he needed a member of his family to help them subdue Raymeyer. Hess and his wife offered their 18-year-old son Wilbert as an assistant. The next evening, November 27, the three of them arrived at Raymeyer's house. He let them in, and they went into the front room. Raymeyer never got the chance to wonder why they had come back for another visit. When his back was turned, the men tackled him to the floor and attempted to tie his legs with a rope they'd brought with them. The exact details of what happened next varied slightly depending on which man told the story, but during the struggle, Raymeyer was beaten and strangled to death. It's possible that Blymeer intended to kill Raymeyer once he reached the house that evening, but if he did, he did not reveal his plans to the other two men. When they realized that Raymeyer was dead, they took all of the money in the house, hoping to make it look like a robbery. They left behind the book and the lock of the old man's hair. He was dead. The hex had been lifted, they thought. But if that was true, Blymere's luck certainly didn't improve. The three men doused the body with kerosene and lit it on fire. 
hoping the flames would spread throughout the house and burn it down. When they left, Raymire's body was engulfed in flames, but somehow the fire mysteriously went out. Some believe that perhaps the hex doctor was not yet dead when he was set on fire and that he might have moved enough to extinguish the flames, but had been burned too badly to survive. Regardless of what happened, evidence of the crime was left behind. Two days later, a neighbor discovered Ray Meyer's body. The shocking crime stunned the community, but the terror and excitement that followed was nothing compared to the story that soon emerged. Alice Raymire informed the police of Blymere and Curry's visit, and they were soon picked up as suspects. As details of the events emerged, newspapers across the country covered the story of the York witchcraft murder with great interest. Every bizarre detail of Blymere's hex-obsessed life was described for the public. When the men went to trial, there were daily reports of the proceedings. Hess received ten years in prison, but Blymere and Curry ended up receiving life sentences for the murder. Both were eventually paroled and lived uneventful lives. Curry, the youngest, served in the military during World War II and became a talented artist. The Hex murder in York County received wide coverage, and while the local authorities did not launch any official assault on folk magic in the area, the press and authorities in other parts of the state eventually would. The sensationalistic newspaper coverage of the case brought intense scrutiny to folk practices, and they were labeled a form of witchcraft. The press maligned all practitioners of powwowing, even if they only practiced the most benign healing services. Lurid descriptions of magic and strange beliefs filled the newspapers and shocked Americans who were unaware that such things were still taking place in the 20th century. Law enforcement officials, doctors, and educators began working together to put an end to what they considered superstitious and dangerous practices. Many of them began attributing supernatural motivations to any strange new cases that they encountered. During the Raymire murder trial, York County Coroner L. V. Zack claimed that the deaths of five children in the previous two years had been caused by powwowers. He said that the children's parents took them to folk healers when they were sick, instead of real doctors, and as a result, they died. He did admit there had been no formal investigations of these cases, but that they were a matter of common knowledge. The New York Times featured the coroner's questionable claims in an article under a dramatic headline that read, Death of Five Babies Laid to Witch Cult. The newspaper quoted unnamed officials of the York County Medical Society, who said that the coroner's count of deaths attributed to witchcraft was much too low. Soon, any death that was even vaguely connected to a powwower or rumored to have a connection was labeled a hex murder. In March 1929, the body of Verna Delp, 21, was discovered in the woods of Catascua near Allentown. On her body were three pieces of paper with magical charms written on them, supposedly to protect from murder and theft. A coroner's report identified three poisons in her body, and it appeared that she had taken them voluntarily. The young woman's adoptive father, August Durhammer, revealed to the police that he'd recently learned that Verna was taking treatments from a powwower and that she'd been planning to visit him on the day that she died. The powwower was identified as a man named Charles T. Bells, and he was arrested thanks to the fact that the police were sure they had another hex murder on their hands. At first, Bells denied treating Verna, but later admitted that he was treating her for eczema. He claimed to only be a faith healer, not a hex doctor. The authorities didn't believe him, and even though they could find no evidence to link him to the crime, continued to hold him in jail. As the investigation continued, it was discovered that Verna was pregnant, and she had not seen her boyfriend, a truck driver named Masters, for several months. She had not yet told her family of the situation and was possibly looking for a way to end the pregnancy. Even after this new information came to light, the police still believed that Bells was partially responsible for her death. The obsession with hexes and powwow distracted the police from other possibilities in the case, including a botched abortion attempt, suicide or murder by someone other than Bells. By April, 
they still had no evidence that Bells was involved with the murder, but he was charged anyway. He finally received a hearing in mid-April after lawyers filed a writ of habeas corpus. He was released on $10,000 bail and charges were eventually dropped. The murder of Verna Delp was never solved. The press jumped on another case of murder by powwow in January 1930. Mrs. Harry McDonald, 34, a housewife from Reading, died after receiving severe burns in her home. She had apparently been given some sort of ointment from a hex doctor with instructions to rub it on her skin. At some point in the night, her body went up in flames when she got too close to her stove. She was seriously injured, and when her husband, who worked the night shift, found her in the morning, she was on the verge of death and could not be saved. The woman's brother told reporters that he believed the lotion she was using was flammable and caught fire, killing his sister. He had no evidence of this, but the press latched on to this theory and kept the story alive with occult connections for weeks. Another hex panic murder occurred on January 20, 1932, when the body of a Philadelphia man named Norman Bechtel, 31, was discovered in Germantown under a tree on a temporarily vacant estate. The accountant and Mennonite church worker had nine stab wounds in and around his heart. Some of the wounds appeared to form the shape of a circle and were delivered with such force that they not only penetrated his suit and overcoat, but his eyeglass case in his pocket as well. A crescent-shaped cut was made on each side of his forehead and a vertical slash ran from his hairline to his nose. Two additional cuts ran off the vertical slash in the direction of the crescent cuts. All of Bechtel's valuables had been taken and his car was later discovered six miles away. From the bloodstains in the automobile, it was clear that Bechtel had known his attacker well enough to let him or her into his car. The case gave all the appearances of a robbery gone bad. But then there were those pesky facial cuts, which detectives surmised might have special occult significance. When it was learned that Bechtel had grown up on a farm near Boyertown, where powwow was common, the police immediately started searching for evidence of another hex murder. Captain Harry Heenley, the chief investigator, had the victim's apartment searched for any possible connection with folk magic, but all they found were Mennonite books and pamphlets. After following a few more leads, the police still had no answers, so the press began calling the mystery a hex murder. Then, in April 1937, William Jordan, 36, confessed that he and four others had killed Bechtel, who they'd been attempting to blackmail. Most of the details of Jordan's confession were not publicly released, as Bechtel had been involved in several love affairs and had a large life insurance policy. Needless to say, the case had nothing to do with magic. If these cases had been the only ones tied to powwow, it's likely that the hex scare would have died out sooner and the public would have lost interest. That was not meant to be, though, for another actual hex murder occurred in 1934, which sealed the fate of folk magic in the state for decades to come. The last true hex murder in Pennsylvania occurred in Pottsville in Shilekill County on Saturday, March 17, 1934. A shotgun blast ended the life of Mrs. Susan Mummy, 63, as it tore through her living room window while she was standing next to her adopted daughter. Mummy was attending to the injured foot of her boarder, Jacob Rice, who was seated in front of her. The oil lamp that her daughter was holding shattered as the shot tore through the window. Mummy was killed, and the other two took cover not knowing if more shots would follow. They waited all night in fear, thinking that an assassin was lurking outside. Finally, as morning approached, Rice decided to make the two-and-a-half-mile trip to Ringtown to report the crime. Initially, the police thought the murder was the result of some backwoods feud that turned violent, but soon the case took a bizarre turn when Albert Shinsky, 24, confessed to the killing. He claimed that the killing had been self-defense and that Mummy had placed a hex on him seven years earlier when he was working in a field across from the Mummy farm. There had been a dispute about the property lines and one day Mrs. Mummy came over the fence and stared at him for a long time, he said. He claimed that he then felt cold perspiration come over him and his arms went limp. 
From that point on, he was unable to work. But that was just the beginning of the torture. Shinsky claimed that whenever he saw a sharp object, it would change into the shape of a black cat with flaming eyes from which he could not look away. The cat also appeared to him sometimes when he was in bed at night. It would creep slowly across the room and jump onto the bed. The appearance of the cat made him so cold, he claimed, that he had to get up and run around the room in order to get warm again. He sought help from several powwowers, but nothing worked. His family thought that he was lying and was just too lazy to work, but Shinsky seemed to genuinely believe that he was hexed. Eventually, when he could take no more of the supernatural harassment, he killed Mummy. He told the police that the minute she died, he felt the curse lift from his shoulders. Prosecutors wanted to give Shinsky the death penalty for the murder, and the press once again emphasized the danger of the strange beliefs and practice of folk magic. Over objections from the police and the prosecutor's office, a commission of doctors ruled that Shinsky was insane and he was sent to Fairview State Hospital. He remained in mental institutions for most of the rest of his life. The case seemed to confirm in the public eye that the belief in witchcraft was some sort of threat to society. Practitioners of powwow still had a few defenders, though, and they retained plenty of clients, but the tide of public opinion had turned against them. Thanks to the two murder cases and the many suspected cases that were inflated by the newspapers, Pennsylvania's school system declared war on the belief in hexes, especially in the rural areas where it seemed most prevalent. It was hoped that within several years a new focus of modern medicine and science could erase these superstitions that seemed to plague the countryside. State authorities also launched a campaign against powwowers and hex doctors directly, arresting and prosecuting them for practicing medicine without a license. Combined with the sensational stories in the media and the assault on folk magic in general, many of the remaining powwowers went underground. Except for the few who retained public storefronts, most of those who continued to practice avoided the public spotlight and downplayed their work to non-believers. They continued to provide services, however, to those who sought them out. As time went on, fewer members of the younger generations showed interest in learning about the old ways of healing and hexes, but the practice refused to die out completely. Many modern healers still exist today, and while they may not be linked to any kind of witchcraft, German folk magic remains alive and well, although believers in the craft today seem far less likely to be driven to murder. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. On April 10, 1963, the USS Thresher sank during a routine test drive, taking 129 souls down with her. Three years later, a family out on a yacht reportedly saw the doomed submarine slip beneath the waves once more. Looking into the wind and spray, the five-strong family saw the name Thresher painted on the side of the submarine and saw that it was badly damaged along the waterline," Alan Wood writes in his book Military Ghosts. Suddenly, the submarine rose bodily into the air and sank quickly beneath the rough running sea. Two sailors visible on the submarine did not move as it sank and went down in their positions. 
After returning to shore, the yacht skipper discovered that the thresher had sank in the same spot he and his family had seen the submarine. Are the victims' ghosts still out there today, 54 years later? They worked in great secrecy. Their goal was to create a society without a king and church. Their ideas were controversial and their members were considered so dangerous that the society was quickly banned. Some think members of the Illuminati are still active, working in secrecy, trying to create a new world order. The Illuminati order still fascinates and frightens people, but who were these people really and what were their goals? Here on Weird Darkness, we will briefly examine facts and history about the Order of the Illuminati, one of the most dangerous secret societies that ever existed. To understand why the Illuminati Society was established, one must first understand how politics and religion influenced Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Our journey takes us back hundreds of years in time to Regensburg in Germany where the secret society was born. The Illuminati Society was created on May 1, 1176 by Johann Adam Weishaupt, who was only 26 years at the time but already a professor. He adopted the name of Brother Spartacus within the order. Weishaupt was fascinated with the current Renaissance ideals and scientific discoveries, such as Isaac Newton's breakthroughs in physics and Galileo's astronomical discoveries based in Copernicus's previous theories and studies. People now knew that Earth was not the center of the universe, and our planet orbited the Sun and not the other way around. There were many secret societies in existence during this period and many felt there was a need to give people power to decide in important matters. The power and role of the authorities and church were questioned. There was a need for a radical change in the society, and Weishaupt thought he had the perfect solution. Weishaupt lectured at the Ingolstadt University in Bayern, and he was the only professor who was not a member of the Jesuit order. In 1773, Pope Clement XIV suppressed the Jesuits, also known as the Society of Jesus. This gave Weishaupt the opportunity to become a professor in canon law. The position had exclusively been held by Jesuit up until that point. In his free time, Weishaupt spent hours discussing new ideas with members of other secret societies. The Illuminati wanted to make fundamental changes in the society. Their goals were abolition of all ordered governments, abolition of private property, abolition of inheritance, abolition of patriotism, abolition of the family – children should be raised by the society abolition of religion, and creation of a world government. The greatest enemy of all was religion that, according to Weishaupt, prevented progress in the society. The aim was to combat religion and foster rationalism in its place. Needless to say that the Illuminati's ideas and goals were so controversial that the entire order and its members were soon considered a dangerous threat to society orders were given to put an end to the Illuminati. Authorities sent agents to infiltrate the society and collect sensitive information that could be used against the order of the Illuminati. This was a challenging task because Illuminati's members were very cautious, secretive, and never undertook unnecessary risks. When they wrote to each other, they never mentioned the society's name, Illuminati. Instead, they used a special sign that served as a symbol of their society, a circle with a dot in the middle, a sign for the shining sun. All members used ancient Greek and Roman names as to hide their identity. Ironically, Weishaupt's agenda promoted free thinking and freedom, but his society certainly did not reflect these thoughts and the order was anything but democratic in nature. Weishaupt believed constant surveillance of the members created several advantages, such as loyalty and eliminated the risk of traitors. 
The actual workings of the order involved spies and counter-spies. Each isolated cell of initiates answered to a supervisor that none of the initiates knew. Weisopt also set specific books and materials that all members had to read. Although Weishaupt's goal was enlightenment for its members and society as a whole, by its own rules and regulations it prevented free thought by its members. The church and authorities started to become impatient. The Illuminati became more and more popular and the secret society gained many followers. Weishaupt wanted to create a large organization, but he had to work hard. He had to prevent that members of the Freemasons joined the Rosicrucian Order. Weishaupt had no respect for and disapproved of the Rosicrucian Order that engaged in worship of the occult and alchemy. The thought that young men are trying to create gold and other nonsense is unacceptable to me, Weishaupt said. The Order of Illuminati existed for almost a decade before it was banned and eradicated by the authorities. In 1784, writings from the order were intercepted in Bavaria and the group was declared seditious and banned. Weishaupt lost his position at the university and fled Bavaria. Once Weishaupt left Bavaria, the order collapsed. The Illuminati came to an end. In 1777, Weishaupt tried a second time to promote his ideologies. He joined the Masonic Lodge, Theodore Zum Guten Roth, in Munich, but his Illuminati reforms were not welcomed and rejected by the Freemasons. Knowing this, Weishaupt created a quasi-Masonic society and recruited members from inside the fraternity. Weishaupt claimed that his system was pure Masonry. Weishaupt wrote four books on the Illuminati over a three-year period while in exile. They were A Complete History of the Persecutions of the Illuminati in Bavaria, 1785, a Picture of Illuminism, 1786, An Apology for the Illuminati, 1786, and An Improved System of Illuminism, 1787. Weishaupt died in Gotha, Germany on November 18, 1830. The Society's influence is still felt today, partly because of the profound association it formed with Freemasons. Visitors to Old Louisville often comment on the abundance of rich woodwork found throughout the interiors of the dwellings here. In addition to ornate staircases and parquet floors, there are coffered ceilings, paneled walls, fireplace mantles, and many other examples of fine millwork and wood carving. By the time construction was in full swing in Old Louisville, Mills in exotic lands were providing a steady stream of ebony, mahogany, teak, and other valuable woods with which to trim out these houses. But early on, the lush areas surrounding the city yielded a steady supply of luxurious and sturdy native woods like cherry, oak, and walnut that appeared in the first homes. Today, when visitors walk through the neighborhood, towering trees hint at the abundance the local countryside must have presented to early settlers and builders. Though many of the largest trees here figured as part of the early landscaping plans, a number of them were already standing when the neighborhood sprang up. Now, during the warm spring and summer months, the dappled shade of their canopies provide welcome relief from the sun but when the chill winds of winter and fall rob them of their leaves, these trees and their bare branches can take on a more sinister appearance. At times, some of them can look downright spooky. At the northwest corner of Park and Sixth in Old Louisville stands a gnarled old tree known by locals as the Spooky Tree. Others call it the Witch's Tree. A jagged canopy of dead branches juts out to the north and large barky warts cover the twisted trunk, adding to its scary appearance. Known as burls, these rounded growths often appear on the tree trunks or branches, and they appear when a deformity arises in the wood grain. According to most experts, burls usually occur when trees undergo some form of stress induced by either environmental or human agents. 
In Old Louisville, however, most don't subscribe to this notion. The strange growths on the spooky old tree came about as the result of witchcraft. Despite the scientific and technological advances of the 19th century, many parts of Louisville's largest city held on to old superstitions and beliefs and curses, black magic and witches was commonplace. Given that the riverboat and rail connections to New Orleans and other points in the South ensured a constant stream of followers of the voodoo arts, these voodoo, also known as hoodoo in some parts, practitioners would keep the old Louisville neighborhood hopping with supernatural action. The Witch's Tree would emerge as a meeting point for many of these dabblers in the so-called black arts. According to local legend, the tree known as the Witch's Tree started its life as a majestic, towering maple, and strange circumstances would account for its altered appearance later on. The original tree supposedly sprang up practically overnight in the late 1800s when the Doomsdale family still owned the land. Famed for the lovely flower beds and hedgerows that graced the grounds of their estate, the Doomsdales once maintained an adjacent tract of land dedicated to the cultivation of ornamental shrubs, myriad rose bushes, and a wide variety of flowers. Known as the Doomsdale Botanical Gardens, it became a popular destination for visitors in search of a bit of rest and relaxation from the hustle and bustle of life in the 19th century metropolis. During the warm months of the Great Southern Exposition from 1883 to 1887, the shady pathways and fragrant blooms provided welcome relief from the Kentucky sun to many thousands of visitors. When word later got out that the Doomsdills planned on selling their beautiful gardens to the city and that planners would develop the land to construct houses, many people in the neighborhood were heartbroken to think they would lose their treasured botanical gardens. The most distraught of all, however, was a coven of local witches. The remarkable tree, once with its perfectly straight trunk but now with its gnarled, twisted appearance, had become the preferred gathering spot for nightly rituals where there would be a mix of potions and casting of spells on those who had incurred their wrath or curried their favor. A terrible travesty had almost cost them their favorite tree fifteen years before, and they were not ready to lose it again. By most accounts, problems began in the spring of 1889 as locals began preparations for their annual May Day celebrations. Although few people still celebrate May 1st as the advent of spring today, Victorian America saw it as a symbolic banishment of the cold winter weather and, as such, a great cause for festivities. And integral to any traditional May Day celebration was a dance around the Maypole. Early Americans, following the traditions of their European ancestors, usually erected maypoles of maple, hawthorn, or birch, and then festooned the tall pole with flowers, greenery, and large wreaths with long colored ribbons suspended from the top. Children would then perform dances around the maypole, their rehearsed steps resulting in the weave of elaborate patterns in the ribbons. Given their connection to the lumber industry, it often fell to members of the Mangle family to organize the neighborhood May Day celebrations every year. Known as the Mahogany Kings among the locals, brothers Charles and Clarence Mangle oversaw a hardwood empire that channeled tons of millwork into the old Louisville construction boom, so it's not surprising that they frequently headed the planning committee. In the early spring of 1889, the Mangles announced that they had selected the tree to be felled for the upcoming celebration, and their choice was the beautiful maple at the corner of 6th and Park. Naturally, the witches were less than thrilled to learn that their beloved maple had been singled out for its flawless shape and impressive height, and when they learned that it would be cut down, shorn of its branches, and then decorated for the festivities, they got together at the beginning of April and posted a parchment note of warning on their tree. Addressed to the Mangles, it not only advised against cutting down the tree, it promised revenge on the city in eleven months if their warning went unheeded. The notice hung on the majestic maple for almost a month and became tattered and torn as the elements battered and blew. 
Although the Mangles were informed of the warning, no one paid much attention to it and the parchment eventually disintegrated and faded away altogether. It seems people didn't take witches as seriously as they had in the olden days after all. On the last day of April, when the two woodsmen from the Mangle factory sawed down the great tree, it was said that a mournful wail could be heard ensuing from the forests to the west of town, where the witches had fled for refuge. By the next day, the lovely maple had been resurrected in a different location, decorated with fresh flowers, colorful ribbons, and boughs of greenery. A ceremony took place and the celebrations went off without a hitch. After the May Day festivities, the trunk was dried out, cut, and then burned in a great Whitsuntide bonfire. By the time the heat of summer arrived, most had forgotten about the witch's warning and the beautiful maple tree. When the winds of fall and winter started whipping through the neighborhood, rumors had it that the coven had relocated to the nearby forest and that they had resumed their nightly gatherings and castings of spells. When townspeople began planning for the next year's May Day celebration, the witch's curse had slipped from memory. Not a soul had an inkling of the tragedy that lay ahead when the eleventh month neared its end. On the evening of March 28th, 1890, the most destructive tornado in the history of Louisville roared in from the west, along Maple Street no less, and destroyed a large portion of the city. Within five minutes, more than 600 buildings, including some 500 homes, 10 tobacco warehouses, three schools, and the main train station had been shattered like kindling. After obliterating half of the downtown area, the twister did a strange thing according to eyewitnesses who said it made an abrupt turn to the south and headed into the area known as Old Louisville today. It was reported that the winds wreaked havoc at the Mangle's largest lumber works, as well as a number of other businesses in the neighborhood, and that dead bodies including horses, cattle, and humans littered the streets. In the end, more than a hundred people died. Several of the victims were supposedly members of the Mangle clan, and weeks would pass before the city was back up and on its feet. Sympathy and support poured in from around the country, and when the end of April rolled around, hardly a soul had thought about that year's May Day festivities. That's when the residents near the Doomsnill Botanical Gardens reported another strange thing about the cyclone as it sped by. Supposedly, as the tornado roared past the corner where the witch's maple had once stood, a fierce bolt of lightning shot out and struck the stump of the shorn tree. When the winds of the storm had subsided, they noticed that a gnarled and twisted tree had magically sprouted up on the spot formerly occupied by the majestic old maple. With its scary warts and burls, the new tree, an Osage orange actually, seemed to be an apt replacement for a coven of witches. As word about the strange tree got out, the citizenry finally recalled the witches and their warning not to cut down their beloved maple. Most speculated that they had conjured up the terrible twister in their new forest home west of town and had sent it into Louisville to exact their revenge. When rumors spread that the witches had returned to their old spot to conduct their nocturnal rituals, nobody said a word, and from that point forward, locals refused to use maples for their annual maypole. Around 1905, when the Domsnills sold their land to developers and many of the trees were felled to make room for the houses built in the new Floral Terrace neighborhood, they made sure to leave the witch's tree standing. People in Old Louisville claim witches still frequent the corner of Park and Sixth today, although they only cast evil spells on very rare occasions and no one dares cut down any more trees of any kind in fear of incurring their wrath. To this day, people say the gnarled old tree violently rattles its brittles and twisted branches in warning whenever a tornado threatens the neighborhood. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, 
helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. N. Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. There is a house that I spent a good portion of my childhood in, and the house that I to this day, although no longer living in it, will always call my true home. I have many fond childhood memories in that house, and it's where our family lived the longest. What I'm about to describe are all real events experienced in this house by me and the rest of my family. These are true accounts and are not exaggerated in any way. We've always known that the house was haunted, not to the point of being insane and deadly like you see in the movies, but plenty of unnerving things have happened there. Let me start by telling you a little bit about the house. The first thing you should know is that it's very old, from the 1800s. It used to be a hotel. When my family bought it, I, being the youngest, was only a little kid. We remodeled that house and even extended it a little. It took a very long time, but eventually that old, rickety house from the 1800s got a brand new, modern makeover. However, the things lingering in that house, which we couldn't see, stayed. At first, it started out with smaller things. My older brother would occasionally be falling asleep in his room upstairs, which was always cold, and someone would blow in his ear. He would open his eyes and look, but of course, nobody would be there. We were told by a few different people that a cranky old woman used to live there who would sit out rocking in her rocking chair on the balcony, which we removed, yelling at people who would walk by. There was one night during which one of my older sisters was sleeping on the couch in the living room and she started hearing a creaking sound. She described it as wood creaking rhythmically coming from the spot just outside of the upstairs windows, which used to be a door that led out to the balcony that no longer exists. One time, when I was little, being all adventurous like I was, I took a digital camera up to the furnished attic at night, where it was quiet and pitch black. I made my way into the middle of the room, held up the camera, and started snapping pictures. I could only see what I was taking pictures of when the camera would flash and then afterwards when I looked at the taken picture on the digital screen. I eventually saw in one of the pictures I had taken while I was facing a wall a small black spot in the middle of the screen. I took another picture, pointing the same way, and I saw the spot was still there but had grown. To me, it looked like some sort of portal to nothingness a small void of blackness in the room, something that sucked up the light of the flash and didn't reflect any back. As I took more and more pictures of it, it got bigger and bigger until it was almost covering the entire camera lens, just blackness. It then occurred to me that rather than growing, this black mass actually seemed to be getting closer and closer to the camera lens. I don't remember anything past that point. I must have ran downstairs. Things started getting more physical. I was once in the shower when the water suddenly got cold and I looked back to find that the knob had been turned significantly behind my back. At night, when alone, we each began to hear loud footsteps above us in the biggest room on the second floor. You would only ever hear them if you were alone or were the only one awake. 
Once they were so heavy it sounded like there was an elephant or something up there, and the ceiling creaked so loud that I half expected it to cave in on me. My sisters shared that room for a long time. Eventually one of them moved out. Only one remained in it, and when she was walking around up there you could hear her footsteps clearly. The only problem was I would also hear those footsteps walking around when she wasn't home. Sometimes I was home alone. My mom was awakened one night when my friend was sleeping over to loud footsteps running up and down the stairs. According to her, it sounded like more than one person and was practically a stampede. She jumped out of bed, angry at us being up so late causing such a racket, opened her bedroom door into the room where you can see the bottom of the stairs, but there was only dead silence and darkness. Everything was still. She thought we must have run upstairs and she had just missed us, so she went up the stairs and opened the door to the room we were sleeping in, which was my sister's old room, now vacant after they had both moved out, but we were sound asleep. She thought maybe we were faking it and inspected us closer and realized that No, we were clearly out cold and had been that way for quite a while. She mentioned all of this to us the next day, maybe still wanting to think that it was us, but we of course had no idea what she was talking about. One night I was just about to fall asleep when I heard a man's voice right in my face whisper the word, BANG! It pulled me out of my sleep making my eyes shoot open and look around the dark room to find nothing. After a minute, still being tired, I brushed it off and closed my eyes again. I started to drift back to sleep when the voice once again quietly whispered, bang, in my face. I opened my eyes again to once again find nothing. This happened a total of three times before I was finally able to fall asleep so many things happened in that house. But after so many years of constant activity, you get used to it, and things that used to frighten you begin to simply annoy you. Sometimes, if you were alone and there was a persistent noise being made where no other person was, like the squeezing and popping sound of plastic water bottles in the kitchen, you could simply look in that direction and say, stop it, and sometimes it would just stop. We were eventually able to get the things that were dwelling in that house out, and the activity after years of persistence stopped altogether. As I said, I still consider that house my one and only true home, and I always will. I spent years growing up there as a child with my family and two of my close friends, as well as family friends. Despite the occasional paranormal activity, I have many good memories of that place. It's where my mind will always wander back to whenever I think home. I was just a little girl, about eight, when my mother and I went to a shabby motel for the night. As my mother talked to the clerk, I felt as if someone or something was staring at me. I walked away from the two adults and looked up at a rather large mirror held up high on the wall. There I saw my mother's boyfriend. He looked down at me with an odd but cold look in his gray eyes. He looked very sad for some reason, but when I blinked, he was gone. Seeing him didn't scare me, but it did surprise me. Four weeks after seeing his image in the mirror, my mother told me, that her ex-boyfriend had died. The urban legend of the phantom or disappearing hitchhiker usually goes something like this. A man is driving down a deserted street late one night when, out of nowhere, a beautiful girl steps out of the darkness and waves to him. He pulls the car over and the girl tells him she needs a ride home. She lives just up the road. She's usually distraught, sometimes crying. Unable to resist her pleas, the man tells her to get in. 
The two of them ride along quietly until the girl finally points to a house and tells the man to drop her off there. The man lets her out of the car and then watches as she walks toward the house. The hitchhiker turns for one last look at the driver, who was kind enough to give her a ride, and then, just like that, she disappears into thin air right before his eyes. Shocked and unable to believe what he has just seen, the man gets out and looks for the girl. She is nowhere to be found. Summoning his courage, the man approaches the house and knocks on the door. It's very late and all of the lights are off. After a few moments, an elderly woman answers the door. She looks a bit disturbed by the presence of this stranger on her front steps. The man apologizes for bothering her so late, and then he proceeds to tell her the story of the hitchhiker, who had asked for a ride to the house. He goes on to describe the girl, even down to the clothes she was wearing. He asks the woman if the girl does indeed live there and has she made it safely inside. The woman's face turns ashen. She begins to tear up as she tells the man that the girl had lived there at one time, many years ago, but he couldn't possibly have given her a ride. The girl was her daughter, Abigail, and she had been dead for nearly twenty years. She had died on the road on that very night seventeen years earlier as she was walking home from a party, struck down by a hit-and-run driver. The man would later find out that he wasn't the only one who had given Abigail a ride over the years. She was known to haunt the road that she'd been killed on, always trying to find her way back home but never making it inside. Each time she was dropped off at the house, she disappeared before crossing the threshold. That's just one version of the story. There are many variations, but they all have the same basic premise. Someone who died, usually in an automobile accident of some sort, is seen wandering the road where the tragedy occurred, usually on the anniversary of their death. They stop cars and ask for a ride home only to disappear either on the way to their destination or once they get there. For decades, people all over the world have claimed that they've given rides to hitchhikers who vanished into thin air. The phenomenon occurs in the United States, Europe, and Asia alike. The stories are all remarkably similar to the one you were just told. For every person who says they have had such an encounter, there is a skeptic who will tell you that it's not possible. People don't haunt the areas they died in, and even if they did, they wouldn't be stopping cars and asking for rides. Theories abound regarding the stories of phantom hitchhikers and the people who claim to have given them rides. Hallucinations are one explanation. After driving for long periods, especially at night, one could begin to see things that aren't there. Of course, that wouldn't explain why so many people have nearly identical experiences. As with all urban legends, it could just be a hoax, perpetrated on a grand scale. One person hears it, and then another, until it spreads all over the world. It begins with, this happened to a friend of a friend, and then takes off like a shot. It could be that at least some of the stories in question really did happen, though they may have been elaborated on over the years. Maybe drivers did pick up hitchhikers only to lose sight of them in the darkness, making it seem as though they vanished. There is still one more possibility, however remote, that some of the encounters with phantom hitchhikers did indeed occur. For those who believe in ghosts, it isn't out of the realm of possibility that a lost soul might be trapped in a purgatory where they are forced to relive the last night of their life over and over again until they reach a destination that no longer welcomes them, thereby keeping them in limbo for eternity. Some will scoff at the notion, but life isn't always black and white, and neither, to be sure, is the afterlife. Not everything can be explained, nor should it. Two of my best friends are very sensitive to the paranormal. 
They both told me this story and it really creeped me out. They are sure what they saw was a demon. The two of them were walking downtown. It was still light out and they were heading for a store. All of a sudden, they said they saw a young man, Andy, being harassed by the police. Andy is homeless, talks to himself, has stalked people, and writes about the devil. He is scary to be around. My friends keep walking after seeing him. Slowly, a car pulls up beside them. In the back seat with the window down is a teenage girl. She's leering at them. She's wearing all black and is almost green in skin color, much like a dead person. The look on her face was so scary that my friends took off running. One of them started to cry. As they run down the street, they see that same girl standing ahead of them. It would not have been humanly possible for her to have gotten out of the car and run down the street before them. She just appeared. They hurriedly ran into the store and prayed that she wouldn't come in after them. They told me they would never wish the experience on anyone. They both have seen a lot of ghosts, but never a demon. They're wondering if the demon was connected to Andy. What do you think this was? When I was about four or five years old, I had an experience that I've tried to make sense of ever since. I had just gone to bed on a summer's night. I know it was summer because it was still light outside, probably about 8.30 p.m. I had not been in bed long and I looked up to the window above and to the left of my bed. I saw a figure in a dark hood. I could not see a face, just blackness. Then the figure spat on me. I felt totally paralyzed. I didn't know what else to do, but as crazy as this may sound, I tried to spit back at the figure. At that point, it disappeared. I didn't see it again. I told my parents about it, but they insisted that it was a bad dream. So I tried to convince myself that it must have been a nightmare for most of my life. However, many years later, my pastor and I were having lunch and somehow the topic turned to the world of darkness, for lack of a handier term. So I told him about my experience and he pointed out some things that led me to believe this was more than a dream. First, this would have occurred around 1967 or 1968. It wasn't like it is today with all the scary movies. In fact, TV was rather wholesome. It was unlikely that I saw something on TV that foreshadowed this and came out in a dream. About spitting, my pastor said this is a very specific demonic activity. However, he didn't know the meaning of it. Does anyone have any idea about this? Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. When I was a child, my family and I lived in a very old house, which my grandfather had built on his own. It was so old that we sometimes saw cockroaches in the kitchen. 
In the kitchen, I used to wash the dishes together with my grandma. But one day, my grandmother suddenly felt very weak and she died. We were very sad. I can remember the funeral because even though I was very young, it was my first experience where any of my relatives had died. Time passed. One day, I was washing dishes in the kitchen. It was a very hot and stuffy day. Then I felt something behind me. I thought it was my mother, so I looked back. There was no one, except this white shadow. It passed by me and disappeared. But strangely, I didn't feel scared. Thinking back, I'm sure that white shadow was my grandmother, and my grandmother had come back to wash the dishes with me. It was nice of you to do so, grandmother. I was raised by my mom and stepfather, who was in every way my dad. He always referred to me as his daughter, and I loved him more than anything growing up. He was part of the sheriff's department based in a major city in the state we lived in. He was raised during the Depression, a first-generation Italian born in the U.S. He was one of the smartest, kindest, most gentle men I've ever met. In 25 years of being a police officer, he only drew his gun a handful of times and never shot anyone. He was forced to retire in 1985 due to a heart condition and developed emphysema several years later. He had his first heart attack when I was 13 and the second when I was 19. After his second heart attack, he and I got into a discussion about death and God. He said that he believed in a higher power but didn't know if there was anything after death. He had the light at the end of the tunnel experience, but he wasn't sure. He did promise me that when he died, if there was something after, he'd find a way to let us know. When my husband and I separated, my dad and mom had me and my kids move in with them. The girls were in my brother's old bedroom, and I was in my childhood room with my son. Ray was 11, Beth 9, Emmy 6, and Nikki 3 when my dad died the Saturday after Thanksgiving, two days after his and my mom's 26th wedding anniversary. We knew that he was living on borrowed time, but his health had been fairly stable and he hadn't had any major issues before the night he passed. It was unexpected and extremely traumatizing for our family Mom was heartbroken and explaining to my children that their grandfather was gone was incredibly difficult. It was not so happy a holiday season for us. By February, our lives were slowly finding our new normal and adjusting to the changes. To give some background that's relevant to this story, my dad only slept four or five hours a night. He was often up until 1 or 2 a.m. and up by 6 a.m., since he went to bed after the rest of us, his nightly routine before he went to bed was to make the rounds, as we called it. He would make sure the back door to outside was locked, then the door to the back porch, which was a closed-in Four Seasons type, then down the hallway, through the kitchen, then the dining room, to the front foyer, where he made sure the front door was locked and the chain was on the door. He'd then go down the hallway from the foyer to the back hall to recheck the back door, and then finish the circle through the kitchen and dining room and up the stairs. It was a distinctive pattern and one that was so normal we didn't pay attention to it anymore. It's an older house, built after World War II for returning soldiers and footsteps can be heard on the floors below fairly well. We'd made the decision to give my oldest daughter her own bedroom with my son and I moving down into the bedrooms in the finished basement several weeks before my dad died. Both my mother and I have been having problems sleeping, and most nights at least one of us would get back up and make some tea, hoping it would help us sleep. One night, neither of us could sleep, and about five minutes after I'd put the kettle on to heat, my mom came downstairs as well. I got her a tea mug, and while the tea was brewing, we were talking, and she mentioned that 
She'd heard me making the rounds earlier and that it was nice I was keeping up my dad's habit. I told her that I had not done that and that I'd heard it as well and thought it was her. We were both speechless for a few moments and then questioned whether we were so used to hearing the sounds that we simply thought we'd heard it. My mother isn't much for anything paranormal or supernatural. She's an Irish Catholic and rather close-minded about a lot of things. We dropped the topic, but for the next few nights I deliberately listened for the sound of footsteps, which in fact did happen every night. About a week later, I was unable to sleep and was in the den, which was located off the kitchen on the opposite side from the dining room. I'd paused the movie I was watching and went in the kitchen to get my tea. As I went to pick up my mug, I heard what sounded like someone rattling the chain on the front door. I went to go look without thinking, and I could see the chain moving. Then I watched as the doorknob started to jiggle slightly, as if someone was turning it to test if it was locked. As I stood there stunned, I heard footsteps walk away from the door and down the hallway on the other side of the stairs heading towards the back door. I went back into the kitchen, and as I looked through the doorway at the back door, the chain on that door started to move, and then again the doorknob. The footsteps started to come into the kitchen and then stopped. I have seen and heard spirits since I was a small child, and it's a gift my kids have all inherited. I didn't see anything, but I distinctly heard my dad's voice say, it's your job now. I could smell his brute aftershave and got a sudden chill. Then it was gone. I didn't tell my mom about it for several weeks, but when I did, she told me that she also had an experience that night. She knew I was up and had heard the tea kettle whistle and debated coming down for some. She decided to just try and sleep, closed her book, turned off the light, and pulled the covers up when someone sat down on my dad's side of the bed and lay down. Mom assumed it was one of my daughters and turned to see which one wanted to sleep with her, but there was no one there. We both agreed that this was my dad's way of letting us know he was still there and watching over us, and even now, almost 20 years later, he still occasionally makes the rounds. It's usually when my mom has been sick or just gotten out of the hospital, but sometimes when it's just a lot of stress in the house. My two youngest daughters still live in the house with my mom, along with my eight-year-old grandson Danny, who's on the autism spectrum. On more than one occasion, Danny has been heard talking to himself, but having odd conversations. My daughter asked him one day what he was talking about, and he looked her straight in the face and told her, Grandfather and I are talking about trains. His mother was nine when my dad died. He had never met him. We don't really talk much about him, except in passing, and my mom doesn't keep pictures up anymore. But Danny could describe him perfectly. He then told my daughter that Grandfather told him to tell her that Morris was keeping him company. Morris was a cat we had while I was growing up. He was 24 when he passed, and my daughter was his favorite, and he had died the same year as my dad. We knew Danny had the gift as well, but apparently my dad chose to only show himself to him. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, 
find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.